still with They Love the Torah. This is the book. We do have more of them coming in, in case you didn't get one. How many of you have been reading it so far? What do you think of it? It's awesome. I only recommend good books. And um, let's see. Where do I want to go from here? Let me move this and this. Okay, here's some... Uh, Going back to other notes, just before I jump into these notes, I have a couple of verses I want to give you that you could just kind of hand write where it says your notes in the bottom corner. And I'm going to show you some PowerPoints here in a minute, too, if they want to get the PowerPoints ready. But uh, it's kind of like a, how many of you believe or desire a real, a real, not the emotional, a real revival to take place? Uh, I mean, do you want that? I mean, not just the roller coaster, emotional, sugar high type of revival, but a, a real revival to take place. <clears throat> well, look at this. This is in Second Kings, chapter twenty-two, verse four. How many remember the little king, eight years old, Josiah? Remember that story? Well, in Second Kings twenty-two, four, <clears throat> it starts off. It says, "Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord." which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people and let them deliver it into the hands of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to do what? To repair the breaches of the house. There were breaches in the house of the Lord. I tell you what, there are a lot of breaches in the house of the Lord today. Okay? And our job is to repair the walls. We need to be the repairers of the breach right well in verse 8 it goes on to say that when they were trying to bring restoration when they were trying to repair the house or the body of messiah however you want to look at it it says hilkiah the high priest said unto shape and the scribe i found the book of the torah in the house of the lord and so hilkiah gave the book to shaphan and he read it so what do we see Revival first comes when people begin to repair and rebuild the house of the Lord, and then when they rediscover the Torah. Okay, and watch what happens. 2 Kings 23, 1 through 3. So the king sent, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, the prophets, all the people, both small and great, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by a pillar, made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes with all their heart, with all their soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And then what do we find in verse 21 and 22, Second uh, Kings 23? It says, the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. And then it says, Surely there was not held such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah. Do you realize this Passover was greater than anything David did, anything Solomon did? This was the greatest Passover that the Bible records has ever been held. And it's because they were trying to repair the house, and they had discovered the Torah. Now look at, now we're going to jump to Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Now how many of you know, by the time the book of Acts is written, Yeshua had already died, he had already risen from the dead, and he's already ascended to heaven, and the Holy Spirit's been poured out, okay? So where is Yeshua right now? He's in heaven. And listen to what Acts 3 says. <clears throat> Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ. Well, wait a minute. I thought he already came. I thought he already left. I thought he already went back. So this verse is talking about the second coming. Okay, he says, repent, be converted, and then it says, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive, or keep him back, until the time of what? The restitution of all things. So Yeshua's not coming back until the times of the restitution of all things. That's what it says. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since when? Not since Acts, since the book of Genesis. So there are things the prophet spoke 
from Genesis clear up into Yeshua that has not been fulfilled yet. So he did not fulfill everything. Because if he had, he'd already be here. And this says he has to stay back until the times of the restitution of all things. Since the world began that the prophets were prophesying. And look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 through 23. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass. And believe me, you're, as we read this, you're going to find out this prophecy has not come to pass yet. Matter of fact, it's been the opposite extreme. It says, there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city will go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also, yea, many people and strong nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts where? In Jerusalem. It doesn't say New York. Okay, it doesn't say Paris. It doesn't say South America. It says strong nations are going to come to seek the Lord in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days it will come to pass that ten men will take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you for we have heard God is with you. Right now, ten men from every nation have taken a hold of the skirt of the Jew to kill him. Okay? But just the opposite is going to be happening. And what's exciting is we are living in this time. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show you some PowerPoints before we get into the notes. Because this kind of just lays the foundation of where we're going to be going over the next 12 weeks. I want to kind of summarize some things. I want to talk about Torah culture. This, for the next 12 weeks, we're going to be talking about a culture of Torah. We're going to talk about Yeshua's family. Did they keep Torah? Okay. How about Yeshua's relatives? Did they keep Torah? Okay. What about Yeshua himself? Okay. What about Yeshua's disciples? Okay. What about his neighbors? Okay. So we have to understand when we read the Bible, that was the culture. Okay. So what we want to do here, uh, and the reason why I hope you guys are coming, how many of you know if you're going to build a house, you have to lay a good foundation? Because you don't want to, you want to build on a solid rock. You don't want to build on sand because storms are going to come. Believe me, like it says in Matthew 7. And I want to make sure everyone is built on a strong foundation, not on emotional sugar high type of a walk with God. And so to begin with, we're going to, I have a little bit of vocabulary. I got a picture of a dictionary here. You're going to find, we're going to use different words here than what you're used to. Maybe not even Hebrew words, but just different words. For example... Rather than saying Jesus, we might say Yeshua. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying the name Jesus. Jesus knows many languages, and that's English, okay? Uh, some people, you know, think that's wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. I like using, I go back and forth, but I like using Yeshua because it kind of breaks the, mi the Greek mindset. Because how many of you know Mary did not know English? Okay, so that wasn't his name name. It's a transliteration, but there's nothing wrong with it. Rather than saying, whoops, let me go back. Rather than saying Christ, we will use the word Messiah because Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointing, which comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, where we get the word Messiah from. Christ doesn't mean anything to people, but Messiah does. And so I like using the word Messiah. Rather than using church, we'll say congregation. Rather than saying New Testament, we'll say Brit Hadashah. Uh, Brit is like the word for covenant, if you remember in this last uh, Hebrew class. Um, <clears throat> so you have Brit Chadashah, that's the New Covenant or the New Testament. Rather than saying Old Testament, we'll say Tanakh, okay, because whenever we hear the word old, we think, ooh, old, bad. Okay, so Tanakh is the, a t it's an acronym. Like if you're in the military, they use acronyms all the time. The word Tanakh is made up of three words. The T stands for Torah, the N stands for the Navim or the Prophets, and the K stands for Ketavim, which is the writings. And so uh, they just combine it and say Tanakh. So if I say Tanakh, I'm referring to the Old Testament. Rather than saying cross, we'll say execution stake. Rather than saying Apostle Paul, we'll say Rabbi Shaul. Now, when I mean, you think about it, I mean, what, we keep saying Apostle Paul all the time, but when you start saying Rabbi Shaul, it does something in your mind. It really does. It's like, oh, well, now wait a minute. Now, this is going to come as a shock to many of you. How many of you have read in your... Oh, don't raise your hand, because I don't want to embarrass you. But how many of you have thought you read in your Bible 
that God changed Paul's name to Saul, or Saul's name to Paul, I mean. God did not change Saul's name to Paul. You will not find that in your Bible. I don't care how hard you look. Nowhere will you find in your Bible that God changed Saul's name to Paul. What you'll find is he went by another name. Like I might be Mark here and I might be Marcos in Mexico. Okay? Do you know why? From what I understand, he went by Paul instead of Shaul? Because in Greek, Shaul means, uh, oops, Shaul means haughty. Oh, hi, haughty one. Okay, so in the Greek culture, you don't want to be called haughty because that's what he, they were saying when they said Shaul. So he went by Paul. It had nothing to do with God changing his name. Take a look if you don't believe me. Anyway, so we're going to say Rabbi Shaul because, again, there's nothing wrong with the name Apostle Paul. I'll use that too. But I want to try to get us back into uh, Torah culture. Okay, so throughout our study that we're going to be doing over this next year, our goal is to strengthen the bond of the body of Messiah to the scriptures of Israel. Okay, that's where ours come from. Believe it or not, their Bible is the same as ours. As far as the Old Testament, it's exactly the same. It's in a little different order, but it's the same. We also want to strengthen the bond to the land of Israel and to the people of Israel. Okay, those are the three things that we want to do. And so, <clears throat> first off, concerning the land of Israel, I just want to show you this map. This green is all Muslim nations. Now, not all Arabs are Muslims. Well, most Arabs are Muslims, some are Christians. But I'm just saying not all Muslims are Arabs. You'll have a lot of Muslims over here, but they're not Arabs. So look at this big green area. All of these are the Muslims. Can you see that little red dot? That is the, they're upset. They don't want to be called a Jewish state. The big whole peace process is held up because they want to be known as a Jewish state. And they say, no, you can't be a Jewish state. That's the big holdup. But look how much land mass they have. Now, let's, rather than just looking at the Muslims, let's look at the Arabs. Here are the Arab countries, the Arab world and Israel. Do you guys realize how, what a little tiny area? And they want to cut that in half. Okay, Now, when I talk about cutting that in half, in case you didn't know, the entire nation of Israel will fit between Gig Harbor and Edomclaw. Did you know that? The entire nation of Israel, in its width, will fit between Gig Harbor and Edomclaw, and the Arabs say that's too much. Now, it's about from the Canadian border to the Oregon border long, but still... I don't know if you, let me see if I've got this picture. I don't have this picture, but do you know the entire nation of Israel will fit in Lake Michigan with room to spare? It's crazy. <clears throat> but here's what they want to do in this peace agreement. They want to give what's, by the West Bank, they mean everything west of the Jordan River, which is here. So all, this is what they want to take away and give to the Palestinian state as well as the Gaza Strip and create a corridor here. <clears throat> but if they give that to the Palestinian state, the nation of Israel is nine miles wide. How do you defend that? Okay, that's at its narrowest. It'll be nine miles wide right here. It's up here for the north. It's only three miles wide. But guess what else? And if you know anything in military, do you want the high ground? <clears throat> this is the high ground. These are the mountains. This is where... Uh, Joseph or Jacob paid with a price for the land in Shechem. And down here is Hebron where Abraham paid with a price. You'll find in a couple of weeks Torah portion, you know, but that's what they want to give. Now, here's what the nation of Israel looks like. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. You go up to Jerusalem, literally, all the way down to the Dead Sea, back up into Jordan. So this, as far as tanks and things like this, they have a natural protection from the Arabs on the east. But if they give all of this to the Palestinians and they get this area, they're in trouble. But I want to show you this. When you think of Jews, I don't know what comes to your mind. But here are Jewish people from South America. Here's Jewish people from Canada, India. There's Jews in China. There's Jews in Sweden. There's Jews from every nation. 
if there's any group that is, uh, it's just, it's crazy. The Jewish people come from every tribe, nation, and tongue, literally. Here's Jews from Ethiopia. So I just want to say that the, the Jewish people love God. Okay, even from the, as a little kid, they start learning the Bible, and uh, they give giving their kids little stuff, Torah scrolls, and I just want people to connect this year to the scriptures of Israel in a new way, to the land of Israel in a new way, to the people of Israel in a new way, because those of you who have been to other countries know that unless you know the culture, you really don't know, you know, what they're talking about. So that's why we want to teach the Brit Hadashah, or the New Testament, or the New Covenant, from a culture that's Hebrew, and what they would have been thinking. Well, how, would, well, how would they have interpreted that verse, or what, what were they studying at the time? So, let's begin. Back, I think I'm on page six. And we're going to look at Yeshua followed Torah, is where we're going to pick it up. <clears throat> and I've got some amazing verses here for you. And that's the reason why we have these notes, too, because it, I encourage everyone, buy a three-ring binder. Get a couple of them. Put these in your notes, because there could come a time when you can have a Bible study in your house. See, that's the thing. You guys are to be equipped for the work of the ministry. I'm not here to do the work of the ministry. I'm here to equip you guys to do the work of the ministry. So that's why we give away the CDs. We give, you know, we got the notes. We got the audio on the web, because we want you guys to be able to take this and run with it. <clears throat> and so, also, I know you guys want to hear what God has to say, not what I have to say. So that's why I like using scripture verses, and I feel safer staying with the Bible. So let's look at <clears throat> Yeshua, if he followed Torah. Matthew seven twelve. look at what Yeshua said. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do to them. How many of you think that's a good thing? He said, for this is what the Torah and the prophets all about. Okay, well, that's what the, that's what the Torah is all about. And then look at Matthew 8, verse 2 through 4. It says, Behold, there came a leper, and they worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And so Jesus put forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See, you tell no man, but look what he told him to do. Go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. <clears throat> now this is huge. When we get to Leviticus and we talk about leprosy, you guys don't really get a handle on what this is saying until you understand the commandment of the leper. And you're going to see how he was, wanted him to go to the priest because that would prove to them that the Messiah was here. Okay, There were a lot of miracle workers back then, but no one had ever been healed of leprosy. Okay, But here's... <clears throat> well, let me... I'll, We'll get there. But now look at uh, Matthew eight nineteen. Here a scribe <clears throat> came and said to him, Master, I will follow you whithersoever thou goest. Okay, well, guess what? A Torah student, especially a scribe, would, not, uh, would only follow someone who followed Torah. Doesn't that make sense? <clears throat> um. This reminds me, though, of another verse I'll just throw in here. It's one of my favorite verses. It's in Luke 9, 57. And it's where these three guys come up and say, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you'll go, right? And one of them said, but allow me first to go and do this. The other one said, Lord, I'll follow you too, but me first. Go do this. Now, how does that, does that make sense? How can they call him Lord and say me first? <clears throat> but uh, I'll jump into here just to give you an example of why you want to study the culture. How many of you have kind of wondered how come Jesus wouldn't allow the guy to go bury his father? I mean, seriously, did you ever wonder, what's the, how come he wouldn't allow, what's wrong with burying your father? But if you don't know the culture, you don't understand why. The reason why is, in Judaism, they have two burials. Okay, what they'll do when someone's dead, okay, they'll put them in the cave, until all the flesh is gone, a year later, they'll take the bones and put them in an ossuary and have a second burial. Well, this guy's dad had already died. He wanted to wait another year for the second burial. And Jesus said, look, he's already dead. Why do you want to wait a whole other year? What's before the, for the second burial? 
So this is some of the things that you'll learn as we go. Okay, Matthew 19, <clears throat> 16 through 19. Here we, it says, that, Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, uh, Which one? And Jesus said, well, you know, don't murder, don't uh, commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. Did you notice he never mentioned any of the ones pertaining man to God? He only mentioned the ones pertaining man to man. And then he says, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. But obviously he didn't say, oh, but only do that until I die. And then you don't have to do it anymore. Okay. Look at Matthew 24, 7 through 12. It says, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many are going to be offended, and they'll betray one another, and they're going to hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, watch. look at this verse many of you are very familiar with. It says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Everyone heard that verse before? It says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same will be saved. That word that's translated iniquity means without Torah. Look it up. Love will grow cold because of people being distanced from Torah. That's why the love is being diminished. They're being, they're being distanced more and more from God's Torah. How many of you believe David loved the Messiah? David loved God, didn't he? Do you think God loved David? Look what David said in Psalm 119. Horror has taken a hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake your Torah. Now look at Proverbs 28.4. They that forsake Torah praise the wicked, the wicked. But those who keep the Torah contend with them. So if you forsake the Torah, you're praising the wicked. <clears throat> you know, there's another verse, I don't have it here, that says those who forsake Torah, even their prayers will be an abomination. That's what it says. You can look it up for yourself. Now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. Oh, thank you. How many, everyone's familiar with this verse. Then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the bright, with the brightness of his coming. The word wicked there, it means without Torah. The Antichrist, his whole being is one without Torah. That's what it means. Same word as iniquity. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, look at this. It says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And then look what Yeshua did. Beginning with what? Moses. Okay, he started with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then all of the prophets. He expounded unto them in all of the scriptures. Now, the Brit Hadashah hadn't been written yet. And he went through all the scriptures of things concerning who? Okay, is Yeshua, the Word of God, isn't that what John 1, 1 says? Is the Torah the Word of God? So Yeshua and the Torah are the same. You have the written Torah and the living Torah. The written Torah told all about him, but the living Torah puts the flesh on it. Look at Luke 24, verse 44 and 45, goes on to say, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? Just concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And when it says the scriptures, what were they referring to? Okay, so as believers in Yeshua, we need to be able to find Yeshua all through the Torah. If he said he's there, do you think he's there? Okay, so that's why this whole next year, we're gonna go through the Torah portions and I'm showing you Yeshua in every one of the Torah portions. I'm going to show you this whole year how he's in every single one of them. Okay, look at 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Here, Rabbi Shaul is speaking to Timothy. And he says, from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. Again, he's talking about Tanakh. And look at this. 
he's talking about the Old Testament here, and he says, from a child you've known the Old Testament, which is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Yeshua HaMashiach. Wow, do you know you can lead someone to the Lord just using the Old Testament? And then it says, this famous verse everyone's familiar with, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all what? So what is the purpose of the scripture? It's to furnish us to do what? Good works don't save you. Once you're saved, though, you're supposed to do something. Does that make sense? So uh, oftentimes people get it turned around. Works will not save you. We're saved by grace through faith. And I don't know how many of you, well, some of you raised your hand, you weren't here on Shabbat. How many of you got heard of a guy named Noah? Okay. Hebrews says it was 11. Everyone was ever familiar with uh, Hebrews 11? What's it called? The what? And Noah was mentioned. So Noah had what? And Genesis 6, it says Noah found what in the eyes of God? Grace. Oh my gosh. Noah was saved. By grace through faith in Genesis. It's always been that way. It's never been any different. Look at Luke 8, 43 and 44. Here we have a woman having an issue of blood for 12 years who is uh, having spent on physicians all her living. Now, is that applicable today too? <laughs> they needed a health care back then. Okay. It says, he was not, she was not able to be healed by anyone having come near behind. She touched the fringe of his garment, and presently the issue of her blood stood. Okay, so what does that tell you? Yeshua did what? He had fringes. He wore tzitzit, which is what it's called, the tassels. Well, that comes from Numbers 15, verse 38 and 39, where it says, Speak to the children of Israel, and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, that they put the fringes on the borders, a ribbon of blue, and it'll be unto you for a fringe. You may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Well, a lot of people that know the story of the woman with the issue of blood don't know the, like uh, Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. <clears throat> well, here's what happened. That the Lord said to the woman that had the issue of blood, your faith has made you whole. Faith in what? Well, the problem is in the English translation. She, it says in the New Testament, she grabbed the hem of his garment. Okay? No, it was his tzitzit. It was the fringe, which also was called wings, just like the, the wings of a bird. Well, look at this prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, concerning the Messiah. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in what? That was referring to the tzitzit. And so she knew this verse, and she was saying, if you're the Messiah, you will have healing in your seat seat. And so she grabbed him, and she was healed. And he said, yes, your faith in the fact that I'm the Messiah, and by this verse, you're healed. So that's what was going on. And then look at this. And then it says, and uh, you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. You shall tread down the wicked. Now look at this. This is something that is very apropos for this day and age if you believe that <clears throat> we're living in these end times or last days. This is where it talks about Elijah coming back, remember? Everyone familiar with that verse in Malachi? You know, before the great and dreadful day, the Lord Elijah is going to come back and the fa turn the hearts of the father, fathers to the children. This verse is right before that. This is talking about the last days. And look at what it says here. You are going to tread down the wicked... There'll be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I command him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. So what he's saying is, in these last days, you are going to be treading the wicked under the soles of your feet. Okay, everyone's afraid of the devil. I want him to flee from you. Okay, well, how do you do that? By remembering the Torah of Moses. You can see why the devil doesn't want us to remember it. Now look at Luke 9, 16. Here we see he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up <clears throat> to heaven, he blessed them. What did he, he, what did he bless? Okay, think about this for a minute. He blessed the five loaves and the two fishes. This is so significant. And then he gave it to the disciples to set before the multitude. 
do you know typically every Jewish prayer, even over the bread and the wine, they don't bless the bread and the wine. They bless the Lord for the bread and the wine, and the Lord blesses the bread and the wine. Okay, so we don't bless food. We bless God, and God blesses the food. If we bless the food, then we're taking on the part of God. We're to bless God, and God says, you bless me, I'll bless your food. Okay, now watch why this is interesting. Look at Exodus 23, 25. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he, or God, shall do what? Bless your bread. He's gonna, God's going to bless your water. He's going to take sicknesses away from your midst. Okay? So we don't bless the food. Who do we bless? And then what does God do? He blesses the food, and he blesses the water. So the fact that Yeshua blessed the food, they would be in shock. He didn't start off with Baruch Atah Adonai, blessed are you, Lord our God. He blessed the food, saying, I'm God. That's why I'm blessing your food. Yeah. That was a shock to them. He was taking, he was doing God's role. He's healing their sicknesses and all their diseases. Okay, look at Luke eleven twenty eight. What does Yeshua, Yeshua say? But he said, yea, rather. Now, how many of you believe if Yeshua said it, that settles it? The Lord said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. What word was he talking about? <laughs> the bread on the wasn't written yet. Okay. Now, the Torah was the spoken word of God, right? Moses heard it direct, and he wrote it down. Okay. All the rest of the, even the Old Testament, all the rest of the prophets, God didn't speak to them mouth to mouth like he did with Moses. He spoke to them in dreams and visions, and they wrote it down. So the Torah is the only spoken word of God that was written down. Now look at Luke 16, 16 and 17. What does he say? The law or the Torah and the prophets were until John. So people think, oh, see, that's it. Then it ended. Wrong interpretation. He says, since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the Torah to fail. How many of you have still seen the heavens around if the heaven and earth are still here, guess what else is still here? God's word. Now, there's uh, an exciting verse I'll be sharing this Saturday, this Shabbat, that how many of you ever heard that verse and you wondered what in the world is that verse talking about where the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force? You ever wonder what, you know, I am going to give you the answer on Shabbat and it will blow your mind. It's nothing like what Christianity teaches. Do you know it's quoting a verse in the Old Testament, in Micah? But if you don't know the connection, and it has nothing to do with what you think it has to do with. But when you find out, it is incredible. It's incredible. But we're going to look at that on Shabbat. Now look at Luke 22, verse 14 and 15. Here it says, when the hour was come, he sat down. And with the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire of desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Okay, so we see Yeshua, he not only wore the fringes, he also kept the Torah, he did Passover. In Exodus 12, I want to bring this out, verse 25 through 27. It says, It'll come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he's promised, that you shall keep this service, and it'll come to pass when your children will say to you, What in the world do you mean by this service? That you are to say it is the sacrifice of what? The Lord's Passover. Does it say the Jewish Passover? Does it say Israel's Passover? It's the Lord's Passover. So if you belong to the Lord, it belongs to you. Who passed over the houses of the children of Egypt. And when he smote the Egyptians, he delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. You know, something else that just jumped to my mind. Uh, you know, how many of you believe in the promises of God? If God promised it, okay. Well, the Torah is full of promises. To me, that's like if you were to sign a contract to, for whatever it would be, 
don't you want to, if there's ever a dispute, to be able to go back to the contract and prove it? Well, now, wait a minute. This is what the contract, you said you would do this, and this is right here. It's written down. Well, that's what God did with the Torah. The Torah is, is more than a contract. It's really a covenant. It's also a ketubah. It's like a marriage covenant, okay, because he loves us. It's, you know, it's not like a prenuptial agreement. It's, this is something he loves us, and he wants, you know. And so, for heaven's sake, we don't want to throw out the Torah. That, that is the proof. That, that's, your, that's your agreement that he's given to us. And then look at John 7, 1 and 2. After these things, Jesus walked into Galilee, and he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, so my point is he also kept the feast of tabernacles. And then Matthew 4, 4. Remember when Jesus was uh, being tempted by Hasatan in the wilderness? What did he use to defend himself? More than that, it was Torah. It was Deuteronomy. Okay, he was using the Torah as a shield. Do you think the devil wants you to have a shield? Do you think the devil wants to take your defenses away? Well, that's why he wants to take Torah away from Christians. Because it's, it, you lower your defenses. If you, I think if Yeshua wanted to use the Torah for his defense, if it's good enough for him, I think it worked for us. And again, it is written, man will not live by bread alone, but by what? How many words? Oh, can we pick and choose and buffet the Torah? Where to live by what? Every word. Every single word. Okay. Matthew 4, 7, Jesus said to him, it's written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, he's quoting Torah. Matthew 4, 10, then Jesus said to him, get the heck out of here, Satan, for it is what? Written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So here Yeshua used the Torah for his weapon, not only for defense, but also as his sword. The Torah is like a sword. It was his attack weapon. See, that's why the devil doesn't want Christians to have their sword to attack with. They got half a sword. Okay, let's look at Matthew 21, 6 through 9. Now look at this. The disciples went, they did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their clothes. They set him on their own. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, straw them in the way. And look at what it says here. The multitudes that went before and that followed Christ saying, Hosanna to the <clears throat> son of David. That means the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So what does that tell us? The common people followed him and thought of him as the Messiah, which they wouldn't have thought if he didn't follow Torah. None of the common people would have thought he was the Messiah if he didn't follow Torah. So how about Yeshua's disciples? Well, every famous rabbi had a Tamid Hakam, which means top dog, the chief student, you know, his main one that he would teach. And in John 18, 10, what do we see? Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and he smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. You know what that tells you? Peter was left-handed. <laughs> More than likely. Okay. Nothing really heavy, it's just, <clears throat> you know. Now, I, I know I have told this one before, so some of you, how does the sheen go? Okay. No. Do you know, they had done some research and study, you know the good thief and the bad thief on the cross? They found out through research who the good thief was. The good thief was the Apostle Paul's dad. Yeah, it says in the Bible. Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. Uh, boo. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Okay, what do we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 1? It says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That place was the temple. They weren't in the upper room. They were in the temple. 
And we see the disciples kept Pentecost also. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, look at Peter here. But as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Well, where did that come from? It is written. It comes from Leviticus. It comes from Torah. Peter didn't say, hey, you don't have to be holy no more. That's done away with. Go say all you want. Now, look at Acts 13, 26. This is important. This is, uh, there were like three different kinds of believers during Yeshua's time in the culture. And it brings them out here. So I want you to follow this with me. Here they say, men and brethren, okay, children of the stock of Abraham, and whoever among you fears God, to you is this word of this salvation sent okay do you notice it says whoever fears god that was not referring to a jewish person that was referring to gentiles who were god fearers and followed torah to what they could to the extent that they were allowed how many of you heard of cornelius look at what it says first off jews in the second temple times believed jews believed that gentiles who kept the Noahide laws would have a part in the kingdom of heaven. The God-fearers were Gentiles who went a step further and also went to the synagogue. They kept the Sabbath, the dietary laws, and they prayed at the hours of prayer. And so what do we see in Acts 10, 1 through 3? There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. I think he played the drums. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but look at this. It says he was a devout man, one that did what? Feared God. So he's devout, he fears God. Believe me, the Gentiles, the Greeks, everyone else, they worship pagan gods. So here's a Gentile who loves the God of Israel. Okay, he was devout. He feared God with all of his house. He gave much alms to the people. He prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour. That's three in the afternoon, time of the evening sacrifice. So here's a Gentile who is... According to temple times, at the morning and evening sacrifice, he's praying to the God of Israel. And look what he did <clears throat> in verse 7. When an angel which spoke into Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants. <clears throat> now, if you're a wealthy soldier and you have two household servants, more than likely your servants are basically slaves or someone from another country. Okay? You following me? And it says, and he also called a devout soldier. So the devout soldier is probably going to be a Roman citizen or whatever. Okay, so he's got three Gentiles, more than likely from three completely different countries. And they waited on him continually. So more than likely, these, at least the soldier was devout. He was religious. And then look at Acts 10, uh, 9 through 16. On the morrow, as they went on their journey, drew nigh to the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's lunchtime. Okay? That's why he's dreaming about food. It's lunchtime. He became hungry. And he would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open, a vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, let down to the earth, wherein were all manners of creepy crawlers, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air, and a voice came to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Do you know the difference between common and unclean? Most people don't know the difference. He said, I've not eaten anything common or unclean. What is the difference between the two? That is so significant. And knowing the Greek words are very significant here in this. Unclean, there's a difference like if I get dirty or my kids get dirty, they play in the mud and they get clean. And if you remember, uh, people in the Bible, it, like if they had leprosy, they were unclean. But when they got cleansed, they, weren't, they were clean. But does that mean you could eat them? Okay, so first off, we've got to understand, when it says clean, if people are clean, that doesn't mean you can eat them. I think everyone got that. So when we're talking clean and unclean animals versus clean and unclean people, you know we're talking about two completely different things. If a pig jumps in the mud... He's dirty, okay? And if he comes out, he's, and you wash him down, the pig is still what? Okay, so you can't, 
clean, unclean animals. You follow me? And you can't unclean a clean animal. But what happens, here's what common means. If someone took a kosher, clean animal and offered them up to an idol and then took them to the market to sell, it's now what? Common. It's not unclean, it's common. And so Peter was saying, not only have I not eaten any food that's unclean, I haven't even eaten clean foods that have been offered up to idols. That's what he was saying. Now, koine, you hear koine Greek, or that means common. And so you find here, he's saying, I haven't eaten anything that's koinos or akathartos. So he's saying, I haven't eaten anything that's common, which is something that is clean, but been offered up to idols or unclean. And then look what the voice says. And a voice spoke at him again the second time and says this. What God has cleansed, do not call what? Okay, it had nothing to do with clean and unclean food. The whole vision had nothing to do with clean or unclean food. And then he says, this was done three times, and the vessel was received up to heaven again. Why was it done three times? One for each one of the people, the devout soldier from one nation, servant from another nation, another servant from another nation. God, the whole purpose, how, if anyone's going to interpret the dream, don't you think Peter should? And how did Peter interpret it? God has showed me not to call any man. It doesn't say call any man unclean. He says don't call any man common. In other words, human beings who worship idols, if they come to an acknowledgement of the Messiah, they're no longer unclean. They're now clean. It doesn't mean Peter can now eat human beings. The whole vision had nothing to do with food. It had to, it had to do with outreach. Okay. And so in Acts 10, 19... While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, three men seek you. That's why the sheet came down three times. And so again, here's Peter's vision in Acts 10, 28. And he said unto them, you know how it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into one of, of another nation. That had nothing to do with Torah. That was a man-made law. He says, God has showed me. That he's interpreting the dream. God has showed me that I should not do what? Call any man common or unclean. So that was the purpose of the vision. It had nothing to do with food. Okay, now we go to 1 John 5, 1 and 2. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah is born of God. Everyone that loves him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now look at this. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? Keep his commandments. Now let me go to page 70 and 71 here to see if there's something I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah. When it says here, and keep his commandments, some people say, well, we, only, we don't keep the Father's commandments, we just keep the Son's commandments. Well, Yeshua said, I didn't come here to speak my own word, I only came to speak what he said. And uh, on page 70 and 71, if you look at this, how many of you know that the, the, the Torah was written in Greek 200 years before Christ ever came? Okay. And... They used here in the Brit Hadashah the same word that they used for the commandments in the Torah. So when he says keep his commandments, it's referring to the Torah. That's the point here. Okay, now let's look at Acts 9, 10 through 12. Oh, good, I'm going to get done on time. Here it says there was another certain disciple at Damascus, and his name was Ananias. Everyone remember Ananias? And uh, to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, I want you to go up to a street, which is called Straight, and inquire the house of Judas for one called Saul. Notice he doesn't say who I changed his name to Saul. Or from Saul to Paul. Of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, and he might receive his sight. Okay, I brought out Ananias here because I want to go to Acts 22, 11, and 12 to see what we know about him. It says that when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to Damascus. This is now Rabbi Shaul speaking. And he says, and one Ananias, who was a devout man according to the Torah, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. So again, here you have, after Messiah died, rose again, left, maybe 20 years later, here are still his disciples who are devout and are living according to Torah. Now, this is going to come as a real shock to most Christians. Look at this next verse in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. 
the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and the great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so here you have a great company of the priests who were obedient to the faith, and they were still doing sacrifices in the temple. But now they understood what they were doing. It all had to do with Messiah. And then look at Acts 21, 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, how many tens of thousands of Jews there are which believe. And guess what? They're all zealous for Torah. Because the Torah's come alive. They see Yeshua in everything. It's not some dry legal. It was some dry legal thing. But once the lights come on and they see it's all about Yeshua, then it takes on a whole new life. It's kind of like the little kids that hate the fence because they want to play in the street. The parents love the fence. The kids hate the fence. Until the kids grow up, then they love the fence. What changed? The fence didn't change. The people's attitude toward the fence is what changed. Okay, two more verses. Uh, Acts 6, 8 through 13. Here we see this guy named Stephen, full of grace and power. He wrought great wonders and signs among the people. Uh, certain men from the so-called synagogue of the freed men. And certain Cyrenians and Alexandrians and Sicilians and men from Roman Asia started to dispute with Stephen. Synagogue of the freed men. I wonder if that means they thought they were free from the Torah or something. They're the ones that are disputing with Stephen. And they instigated some to say, We have heard him speaking blasphemy against Moses and against God. And in this way they excited the people. The elders and the scribes rushed upon him and seized him and brought him to the Sanhedrin. They also set up what? False witnesses. So Stephen did not do anything against Moses or the temple. They was a bunch of liars who said he was doing something. So even Stephen followed Torah. And then look at Acts 21, 26 and 29. Here Paul took men, and after purifying himself with them, the next day, where does he go? Rabbi Shaul goes into the temple to declare the fulfillment of the days of purification until the offering was offered for every single one of them. So he also did sacrifices. But when the seven days were almost over, the Asiatic Jews caught sight of him in the temple. They began to stir up all the crowds and laid hands on him, shouting, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who goes everywhere preaching to everybody against the people and the Torah and this place. So what is that telling you? Because they were all lying, that tells you Peter did not preach against Torah. He did not preach against the temple. He did not preach against the Jews. And then they go on and say, he's actually brought Gentiles even into the temple and has desecrated the holy place. But they had formerly seen these two guys with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul brought him in the temple. Paul never did. So I want you to see that Rabbi Shaul kept Torah. Rabbi Shaul went to the temple. Rabbi Shaul did sacrifices. And so anyway, we have some questions for thought here. What are some different ways Torah could be defined? What is the true definition of Torah? Instruction, teaching, just like 2 Timothy 3.16. Did Yeshua follow Torah or do away with Torah? He followed Torah. What would be the consequence if Yeshua did not follow Torah or broke Torah? He couldn't be the Messiah. And what does the name Yeshua mean? Would Yeshua ever break his own word? If he's the word of God and the Torah is the word of God and he's the one that wrote it, he's not going to break his own word. Matter of fact, there's a verse that says God exalted his word even above his name. Because your name is based on if you what? Keep your word. Did Yeshua keep the Sabbath? After Yeshua rose from the dead, did the Jews who believed in Yeshua still keep Torah? Okay, so this is a good foundation. And I think you can look at these scriptures and see we've laid a good foundation. Amen? All right, and now we're going to go from here, and we're going to begin to put the building blocks together and the pieces together, and you're going to learn Hebrew, and you guys are awesome. So let's stand. Oh, also, there's this book called Reasons for Christians to Celebrate the Biblical Feast by Dan and Brenda Cathcart, and this is the last day they'll actually be signing them if you want them. Uh, they're back there on the table. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. I pray, God, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, just as you did on the road to Emmaus, just as you spoke to all the disciples, that you would begin to open your Torah and that we would find you in it. This is your love letter to us. We don't want to throw it away. We want to dig in and see all the treasures that are hidden within it about you. And thank you very much.